welcome back to ATA's Econ Chat, brought to you by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance. I am your host, as usual, John Humphreys from the ATA, the Chief Economist at the ATA, and I am joined, as as nearly always, by uh, Jean Tunney from Adept Economics, the Director and Founder of Adept Economics. How are you doing today, Jean? Good, thanks, John. How about you? Yeah, another beautiful day in paradise. Um, well enough, well enough. Um, the... Uh, okay, sorry, where do I start? Um, so please, if you're watching this, give it a like, give it a share, give us a follow. You could be watching this on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, we live stream this to uh, my personal channel, John Humphreys, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance channel, and to The Good Source. You'd do us a great favour if you could jump on all three of those channels and give us all a follow. Give us all a follow on those channels to keep the algorithm ticking over for the social media giants. You can also find me on Rumble for the inevitable day when I eventually say the wrong thing and get kicked off out of polite society. Uh, this is a casual and interactive live stream. We do uh, every Tuesday or most Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Queensland time, uh, which is 8 p.m. New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania, 7.30 South Australia and 5 p.m. WA. I finally worked out what the different times are for all the states. So, uh, you know, you're very welcome. Casual and interactive. Casual as in... Uh, we don't have a script. I don't know what Gene's going to say. Gene doesn't know what I'm going to say, but I'm sure we'll find a way to banter through whatever comes up. And interactive, that means the chats are open. Uh, if you're following on Facebook or YouTube, you'll see down the bottom or to the side that you can tap in a comment as we go. We'll be watching for those comments as we go. So please write in, say hello, um, give us a complaint, ask some questions, disagree all you like. Right. And uh, if you raise a topic that's more interesting than what we were going to talk about, we are happy to get distracted and talk about your topics instead of ours. But uh, we do have a couple of things that we try to have a quick look at. Unless you guys, unless the viewing audience at home comes across, comes along with a better topic. We've got a few things that we've noticed from the past week. Uh, good evening, Roberto. Um, and someone's already got a question. Oh, well, Nick, that is exactly... Uh, the thing that occurred to us that we will have a chat about as well. The fact that some banks in the US have collapsed and people have uh, asked the question, is this the global financial crisis, the sequel? You know, And do sequels ever live up to the original? Uh, look, it's probably not quite the same thing as the GFC, but it is something uh, worth exploring. And I will unpack that a little bit in, I guess, what I'll call the second half of the show. Because the first thing we often do is just have a quick look through the latest news uh, the latest news and views in economics and uh, politics in Australia, just to catch people up in case you haven't been watching as closely as you otherwise could. So I think um, there wasn't a lot of news this week, but just uh, a couple of things showed up on my radar. Uh, one is, uh, this is the, well, I mean, firstly, if you ever want to catch up on where we're at statistically, abs.gov.au, this has got the CPI, the GDP, unemployment rate. Um, but uh, something that came out of the ABS, the value of dwellings, a uh, small little tidbit of information here for the last quarter, the December quarter. So this is uh, accounts October, November, December last year. House prices continued to, to come off the boil, right? So this, they're not collapsing. I think that would be uh, ridiculous and dramatic talk, but they are coming down 3.2%. The average house price dropped 3.2%. The total value of uh, housing uh, dropped by 2.7%, so around 3% decrease in house prices. One little thing to note about that is nearly all of the drop was on the East Coast. So WA is not dropping and South Australia and Northern Territory is staying pretty stable as well. So it's the East Coast, but yeah, property prices coming down, FYI. The other uh, little factoid that came out, consumer sentiment, the Westpac Bank uh, releases these semi-regularly. Consumer sentiment is staying quite low. You'll see down here. If, you're, if you can see where my mouse is at the bottom right of the screen, uh, consumer sentiment dropped to a fairly low uh, 78.5 on their on their metric last month, and it has stayed down there this month. So their headline consumer sentiment holds near 30-year low. Um, so again, these small data points, you don't want to overinterpret any individual one, uh, but if you keep watching week on, week out, then you start, if you start to notice a trend, it can tell you a picture when you add it all up together. Uh, so those are the two data points I saw. Gene, what did you see this week? 
Well, John, I think the big bit of news that came out today, other than the stuff around banks, but in, in terms of local data, is the uh, monthly business survey data for, from uh, National Australia Bank, NAB, which suggests that business conditions are still strong. So the actual level of activity that uh, uh, the survey respondents are reporting to NAB, it, it's still very high. Confidence is low, confidence has fallen below uh, average, but that's because businesses are obviously anticipating the downturn later this year. It's not happening at the moment according to that survey. I know you think that we're currently in a, a, a downturn, maybe not a recession, but you think you see that already occurring, but business, the survey respondents uh, re responding to this NAB survey would say otherwise, although they are concerned about later in the later this year for sure. So that's another bit of uh, data that's come out, and that's one that's closely watched by the market. Yeah, then I guess that's a, a data point against my thesis to remind uh, people listening on. Uh, my thesis is that we're already in a per capita recession. Per capita re a recession, two quarters of negative growth. Uh, the December quarter, the last quarter we have accounts for had a very small decrease in per capita GDP. So that's one negative. And I think the, uh, the, the current quarter we're in now will end up being a negative per capita. Uh, I don't know that yet. We won't know until April, but if I'm right, then we are currently in a per capita recession. Uh, and uh, but as Gene points out, not all the data backs me up. Some does, uh, but not all. And this, uh, this bank news may end up uh, helping prove me right, but uh, we'll see. John, it looks we'll like see what comes. can't hear me, so that issue that you spotted looks like it is an issue. Let me see what I can do. I might have to disconnect and reconnect. All right, is that uh, true? Are other people struggling to, to hear Gene? Um, yeah, we've got another one in. Gene's mic not working for Facebook. I, I think it's not working in general. All right, I, I couldn't hear him clearly. I just thought I was going senile and uh, getting old and not being able to work out the technology. But... Um, I'm going to give a little rant about the, the bank situation then, Gene. Do you want to play around on your end, see if you can uh, fix the tech and let me know when you're back in the room? All right. Uh, all right. So, well, actually, maybe I'll just... There we go. We'll see. We'll be able to keep an eye on Gene on the side there. So, as people may have heard or may not, but you should have heard, they, there were a couple of banks in the U.S., that have uh, recently got into trouble. A couple of bank failures, uh, bank collapses in the US. The main one is the Silicon Valley Bank, but there were a couple of other smaller banks that have gone to the wall. So I wanna quickly run through a couple of things. One is what happened. That's the, the first one, give us some context. Uh, but the more interesting ones then, what was the response? So going from the, the economics into the politics, what was the response? And then what are some of the potential costs or consequences of the response? All right, so it's the, the, the trick to good economics is to not just look at what's happening immediately, but what are the long-term consequences and what are the unseen consequences and what are the unintended consequences? So I want to chat about a few of those unintended consequences from the policy, from the semi-bailouts, the partial bailouts that the uh, US government has pursued in response to these bank failures. Firstly, what happened? All right, the context here. We've got inflation, everyone knows, interest rates have been going up. One of the consequences of that is that there's been a slowdown in the U.S. tech sector. I mean, there's been a lot of commentary about that already. There's been job layoffs in the U.S. tech sector. One of the implications or one of the consequences from that is some tech businesses have been needing to lean more heavily on their lines of credit. They've been taking more money out of the bank effectively. Uh, so they've been drawing or leaning more on the banks that they use. And there is a bank in America, the Silicon Valley Bank, that is very uh, reliant or has a has a lot of customers that are tech businesses, there are a lot of customers who are startup businesses. They're, they're not primarily a bank to regular mom and pups and, and normal people like us if we uh, get to count ourselves as normal. They, they have a lot of uh, their customers, a lot of their clients are tech and startup businesses. Those tech and startup businesses put money in Silicon Valley Bank Silicon Valley Bank then has a bunch of their own assets. That's fine. Working normally, a lot of these small businesses started to pull out more money. Right? So this created a, uh, a bit of a liquidity issue for the bank because banks don't keep all of the money you put in the bank. They don't just keep it uh, in, a, in a big safe like Scrooge McDuck. They don't just keep it under their bed. They keep some of the money in the bank. 
uh, they put most of the money they put into investments, right? They buy other assets. They buy financial assets normally. Uh, so they don't have all of the liquidity there. They generally do, I mean, they should, if they're solvent, have enough assets to cover all the money they owe their customers, uh, but they don't have it all in cash. So when a lot of customers want to take out their money at the same time, they can face a liquidity issue. And there's two different sorts of problems, and we'll touch on both of them here. There's the, the problem of uh, illiquidity or not enough liquidity, and there's the problem of insolvency, which is actually going bust, right? Failing, going broke. Uh, so there are two different issues. The first issue here was the uh, Silicon Valley Bank faced a liquidity issue where a lot of their customers were wanting money quite quickly and they only had a small amount of money easily available. So what do you do in that situation? Well, you, you go to the assets that you've uh, got locked up elsewhere, the financial assets. What you've done with their money is you've bought other financial assets. You can go back and then sell those financial assets and turn it into cash, which is then liquid, and then you can give that cash back to your depositors. So that's the normal way of doing things. The problem or the, the crux of the issue is that the assets that Silicon Valley Bank owned weren't prudently managed for risk. Uh, and the, the specific issue is they owned a lot of government bonds, which is to say they lent a lot of money to the government, but they did that by buying bonds. And they bought these bonds where interest rates were low, interest rates have gone up, and interest rates and bond prices uh, move inversely to each other. So if interest rates go up, bond prices go down. If interest rates go down, bond prices go up. So they bought bonds when bonds were quite expensive, i.e. when interest rates were low. Now interest rates have gone up and bond prices have gone down. And that wouldn't be a big problem if they could just hold on to those bonds. But as I said earlier, they have a liquidity issue. They need to sell their assets to be able to pay out their depositors. And so they've been forced to sell these bonds while the bond price is low, which means they had to realize a bunch of losses. And this is one way an illiquidity problem can turn into an insolvency problem. The illiquidity meant they had to sell some of their assets, sold them at a loss, and this ended up meaning they, they looked like they weren't going to have enough assets once they sold them all. They weren't going to have enough money to then pay out their depositors. And this creates the real drama then. This creates the actual bank failure, and this creates a lot of fear and a threat of a bank run and a threat of contagion. Uh, and not only in that situation do the banks, the owners of the banks go bust, but potentially a lot of people who have put money in the bank, right? These small businesses that had money in the bank could uh, potentially end up losing their money. And, and that's been the issue primarily motivating the call for a political response. So that's what happened. I'll move on to now part two of this. What was the political response? So there's, I'm going to frame this as three different options, right? The two options that come immediately to mind is that the government could do nothing and allow the bank to fail. Or the government could step in and bail out the bank, right? That's the, the simple binary uh, approach to this issue. The US government, uh, well, back in the GFC, they basically bailed out the banks. Right? That was quite uh, famously remembered these days, and a lot of people upset in hindsight. They've kind of taken a third option here, what I've kind of called a, a partial bailout. I think it could be analogized to the idea, effectively, the US government has come in and bought these failing banks at the price of how much they owe the depositors. Then they're going to pay out all the depositors and then they're going to shut down the bank. So it's like a partial bailout. What they've done is they've bailed out the customers of the bank, but they haven't bailed out the bank itself, if that makes sense. Right? So the, the, the last time a full bailout is to actually bail out the bank so that the bank can keep operating. They haven't done that. This bank will not continue operating. Uh, anyone who owns shares in this bank is going to lose all their money. People who worked at this bank are going to lose their job. The bank is going to not be saved. But the government has decided to step in and bail out all of the customers of the bank, right? all of the depositors. They've decided to give complete deposit insurance. So that's the approach they've taken. Uh, now, at first blush, it's quite easy to see why they would take this step. You can imagine a lot of small businesses with money in Silicon Valley Bank weren't going to have access to their money. They weren't going to be able to pay payroll. They weren't going to be able to pay suppliers. You can see where the contagion would come from. This would have created a bit of a downturn. There'd be a bunch of businesses, more than just the bank, a bunch of other businesses going bust, uh, a bunch of other businesses relying on those businesses potentially going bust, uh, some other banks that may have uh, be cross-investing in this bank potentially then also being exposed uh, to, to fears. Customers of other banks will start worrying, is my bank in a similar bad state? And they might try to take money out, which creates a liquidity problem. 
And if those other banks haven't managed their assets well, as I said before, if you haven't managed your risk on your assets well, a liquidity problem can turn into an insolvency problem. So there is a, if they didn't bail out the banks, if they didn't do this partial bailout, I think it is fair to say this problem would have got bigger. Uh, not infinitely bigger, it's not the end of the world, but there would have been a downturn, especially in the sectors being impacted, which is the tech sectors primarily in California. So there would have been that downturn. So that's the argument for some sort of bailout, this partial bailout. But now I wanna to go to the issue of the unintended consequences, the unexpected consequences, the hidden consequences. And that's the difference, as Bastiat said, I mean, this is the point of properly understanding an issue. It's easy to look at the immediate and the obvious consequences and the intended consequences. Good economics is about looking at the long-term, the, uh, the indirect and the unintended consequences. So what's the problem with this bailout? The problem is, and you would have heard this word before, moral hazard. Uh, so they are going to successfully, I think, and we'll wait and see to see if this sparks another GFC. I don't think it will. I think they will successfully contain this issue. But I fear that the cost of containing this issue is going to be to further exacerbate the underlying problems in financial markets, leading us slowly, drip, 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 moving towards a situation of a, uh, a thoroughly inefficient and overly risky financial sector, which will either lead to further collapses down the road or an increasingly, increasingly nationalized financial sector, both of which I think are bad outcomes. So this is an indirect, unintended, uh, difficult to see problem. And because it's indirect and long-term, it's easy to push it off for the future. Right. They're facing a situation of seeing businesses go bust now uh, or just creating this long-term problem. And so the politicians have chosen to create this long-term problem. What do I mean what, by moral hazard? What do I mean by this long-term problem? Moral hazard is basically where the, your incentives are misaligned so that you're not responsible for the decisions you make or you are in, incompletely responsible. So if you can take decisions and you're not liable for the outcome, then your decisions aren't going to be as responsible. So there, a situation where there's no moral hazard is if you make a choice, you get the consequences of that choice. If you make a good choice, you get lots of good consequences. If you make a bad choice, you get the bad consequences. That's no moral hazard. Moral hazard kicks in where if you make a good choice, you don't get the benefit. If you make a bad choice, someone else bails you out and you don't get the costs. In that situation, you have far less incentive to make good decisions. And that's the problem. And indeed, you can end up having incentives, proactive incentives, encouraging people to make bad decisions. And that's what I believe we're going to see steadily more of. Just drip, drip, drip. Not suddenly a massive spike that everyone can see on the spot, but drip, drip, drip. What this means now that the US government has established that they will bail out all depositors of small banks. This was considered a small bank. It was under the cap of officially systemically important banks. So now that they bail out depositors, if you're a depositor, there's two things you could consider in which bank you're going to bank with. One is, what's the return? You know, what benefit do you get from banking there? What's the return you get? The second thing is, what's the risk? Right, so those, if you're a wise person, those are the two things you're factoring in. You want a high return, but you want a low risk. And people balance these things together and people who are willing to take high risks do riskier things and they tend to get higher rewards when it pays off, but occasionally they lose their money. And people who are risk averse take less risk and they invest in safer things, but then they get less return, right? Less reward because of it. And there's nothing wrong with either of those choices, right? There's different people in the world. But now we've got a situation where the government's come along and basically said, I will take all your risk, right? No matter how risky your decision, don't worry. If it pays off, you keep the benefit. If it doesn't pay off, I'll, I'll pick up the cost. It's heads I win, tails you lose. Or as it's been called sometimes, it's capitalism when you're winning, socialism when you're losing. And if I'm winning, I want to pocket the profits. If I'm losing, I want the government to come in and subsidize my losses so that I don't feel the pain. And the problem with that is it basically incentivizes people to take too many risks. That's the logical consequence of continually bailing out people for making bad decisions. You incentivize bad decisions. So there's going to be now a, a greater willingness for people to deposit their money in banks that take more risks and therefore give higher rewards. And I don't blame any of the consumers and the depositors for doing that. That's exactly the incentive they have been given by the government. 
The government is incentivizing them to pick high, uh, high risk, high reward options. And then they will pick that. Uh, and then we're going to see those banks, then the, the banks that offer these high risk, high reward options will get customers. The responsible banks will lose customers. The consequence of the government's decision is that responsible banks that are good at risk management will lose customers and will shrink. And the government will help funnel everybody towards the irresponsible banks that have high risk. Now, there's two ways that could play out. One is that uh, more people go to risky banks. There are more risky banks. They take more risks. Sometimes they pay off. And then eventually, a couple of years in the future, at I don't know when, these risks will sort of blow up, uh, implode, something will go wrong, and then we will face a bigger crisis. That's one possible outcome. The other possible outcome, and I think I fear this one even more, is that the government notices this. They notice that they have incentivized bad risk management and excessive risk taking. So what they do is they use this as the justification for then increasing regulation to control the risk. So the government has incentivized banks to take too much risk, and then they step in and regulate it and say, no, 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 you're not allowed to take that risk. You're not allowed to take that risk. Yes, you can take that risk, but not that risk. So that's, it is a logical consequence from moral hazard. If you want bailouts and you want the moral hazard, the next logical step is a politician then stepping in to regulate the banks. And this is what I fear. I think we are taking step by step. We are moving towards a system of the amalgam of big banks and big government. You know, Jim Chalmers would love it, right? <laughs> we talked about this previously, the amalgam of, of big business and big government. We are moving steadily towards that, I think, with the government bailing out banks, creating moral hazard, creating a justification for regulation. And then there is always a politician and a bureaucrat looking over the shoulder of the financial sector, determining uh, which risks can be taken, which investments can be taken. And you don't have to go very far down that road, I think, to, to end up regretting it. Uh, I don't think long term we can trust politicians to allocate capital. That is basically the definition of it's socialism or fascism or you know, government control of allocation of resources. That's the thing that doesn't work. When we say capitalism works, we mean the capitalist allocation of capital. If we go down the path of having politicians allocating capital, uh, you know, it can work occasionally. They can when they pick winners. They can occasionally pick winners. But long term, the politicians don't have a great track record at picking winners uh, and driving innovation and economic growth. So I, I worry about that. Now that's you know dramatizing a little bit, a bit of hyperbole. We're not just taking a step tomorrow into complete socialism. But as I said before, just drip, drip, drip. We are walking down this path of increasing moral hazard, incentivizing bad decisions, and then using that to justify more regulation. And it's not a path I think we should be on. I would prefer, and this is the tough decision, and I understand why politicians shy away from it. And it is, it is a harsh, it's a harsh medicine. I would prefer that we just let the bank fail. That would create a short, sharp downturn. I think it would bounce back quickly and we would help get, well, not get rid of moral hazard. We would help decrease that moral hazard. We would help start to address this underlying issue that I think is eating away at our financial sector. So that would be my suggestion here. It will not be a popular one. I don't think it'll be a popular one in the economic field. It certainly won't be popular amongst politicians, but I think at some stage we have to start taking our financial medicine or we risk really undermining the effectiveness of our financial sector. And thus ends my rant. So, Gene, I don't know if your uh, audio is working, but what say you? Uh, hopefully it is. Can you hear me? I can. That's better for me. Can the people listening at home uh, let us know whether you can uh, hear Gene clearly now? Um, well, I'm going to assume. That's a good sign if you can hear. Okay. Sorry, what? That was a joke. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, excellent. Uh, it looks like it's okay. John, I think, yeah, very good points. Uh, Ken Griffin, the uh, CEO of uh, the Citadel Hedge Fund, uh, said that uh, US capitalism is breaking down before our eyes. So <laughs> he's very concerned uh, uh, for similar reasons. And let's think about it. I mean, the, it's not necessarily mums and dads, is it? It's, uh, it's a lot of startups and tech businesses that invested in or had their money in that Silicon Valley bank. And lots of them had large balances and well in excess of the 250K that the 
uh, Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Commission or FDIC that it would guarantee. And so they've only got themselves to blame, really, if they lose it. Uh, so, um, look, I think there was scope to to let this play out a lot differently and try to remove that uh, moral hazard in the future. So, um, yeah, fully agree with you there. I'm not worried about GFC 2.0 at the moment. I think that, I mean, this is not uh, one of the, this is not like Lehman Brothers. It's not a, a household name. And yeah, I don't, I don't think it's as systemically important as, uh, as say Lehman Brothers was. Uh, so yeah, I'm not exactly, I'm not super worried about it at the moment. Uh, you know, that said, I mean, we know that bank runs uh, are possible, but, but what the, I guess what the Treasury and what the Federal Reserve and FDIC are trying to do is to prevent that from happening. They're, they're preventing a problem in the short term by uh, yeah, creating one in the long term for sure, as you noted. So uh, yeah, I think what you said was uh, was very sound, John. Yeah, your point on it's not mum and pups here is true. Not mum and pups, pops. Mum and, mums and dads, it's not normal uh, depositors in these banks. And there is a, a federal insurance system mandated on US banks where the banks have to take out deposit insurance up to 250,000. And a lot of us don't have much more than 250,000 floating around in a bank account. So that's designed to basically ensure that regular people, normal people, uh, can't you know, lose the shirts off their backs. And that already exists. So what we're talking about here is businesses. Now, there is there is some degree to which because this, the, uh, they are businesses that deposited with these failed banks, then that was going to create more contagion. Because this means those businesses then go bust potentially if they can't make their payroll, if they can't pay their suppliers, they have to put off workers, they might go bankrupt entirely, uh, they then can't pay their suppliers, those suppliers uh, cop a problem as well. So there would be contagion, there would be cost. I want to be completely upfront. My suggestion is not some sort of utopia or nirvana. There would be costs, it would hurt uh, some of those businesses. And I don't want to hurt them, that's not my goal. I just fear that long term, the costs of bailing them out is going to be end up being worse for most people uh, than the the short term costs of taking the medicine of making that bad decision. And look, you're right. The the depositors to some degree have themselves to blame, although to some degree we've still got the the government to blame. It sounds like a very cliche thing for me to say, but most previous uh, financial crises, at least in recent history, have led the government to bail people out. So people are starting to already factor this in. To some degree, I would say this crisis, this financial crisis right now, is a consequence of previous moral hazard. So previous moral hazard has taught people, oh, you don't really have to look into the, 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 the solvency of your bank. You don't have to worry too much about the asset structure of your bank. Right? Don't bother looking into that stuff. If they've got a good return, just take it. Because you don't really have to worry about being prudent because the government will bail you out. We already have a lot of moral hazard in our system. And I would say to some degree that pre-existing moral hazard helped cause this problem, uh, caused by moral hazard. And what we do is we increase the moral hazard and in three or five or seven years time, we'll be sitting around with a yet another problem that probably also caused by moral hazard. And then will the government have the guts to do the right thing then? Probably not, right? They just keep kicking the can down the road. It becomes harder and harder to make a responsible decision. Eventually, we either end up pseudo-nationalizing our banks or somebody has to make a hard decision, a responsible decision. And I wish they would make that responsible decision now. Look, I, I should say, uh, I don't know if it's uh, two cheers, two cheers for this decision. It is a partial bailout. Now, that means I am partially against it, but that is better than a full bailout. So th this is worth noting, right? There's been some debate about whether we should call this a bailout or not. And I understand there's, uh, by just saying bailout, you could give the impression that it's equivalent to what happened under the GFC, the global financial crisis uh, in 2008. Uh, it is slightly different in that they're not completely bailing out the businesses. And that's a good thing, right? At least the owners of the businesses uh, directly suffer the consequences uh, of their decisions, right? So there is some real accountability going on there. So that is half a step forward. Uh, I just wish that we could get the complete accountability going uh, across the system. So we got a comment from Sandy. Agree, the shareholders are taking the full risk. Um, look, and, and as you're supposed to look, I, sometimes there is a misunderstanding that 
pro-capitalists, pro-market people such as myself are always pro-business. I want, if a business makes good decisions and gives the customers what they want and gives customers a lot of benefits, I want that business to make money. I want them to make profit. I want the shareholders to make money. I want the people who came up with that business to make money. I want them to succeed. If they make bad decisions, if they don't give customers what they want, right, if they make a bad product, I don't want them to be protected. I am not pro-business just simply on the basis that, that they're a business. Uh, I am pro the idea that uh, the market structure will help ensure the better businesses rise to the top. And for that, you need to reward good decisions and punish bad decisions. You need both sides. You need to be a capitalist when you're winning and a capitalist when you're losing. And that's the way to create the right incentives. And I worry sometimes that today we are tiptoeing towards exactly what the socialists accuse capitalism of being, where they say, all right, you're a capitalist when you're making money, but you want bailouts when you're losing money. And that critique of capitalism, well, that critique really is a critique of corporatism. I think it is a fair critique. Right? That is not a good way to run a system. When businesses do well, I want them to profit. When they make mistakes, okay, sadly for the people involved, I don't like it if people get hurt, but if they make mistakes, they need to feel the financial consequences of those mistakes so that the incentives are properly aligned. Uh, so that's the shareholders needed to take the risk. I think depositors need to learn to be more responsible with which uh, financial organizations and institutions they deal with. And at the moment, we are just creating more incentives for them to abrogate their responsibility. That is that is my fear. Um, I'm going to check through to see. Uh, feel free to come back at that, Gene. I'm just going to check through to see if we've got any more questions and comments coming in. Nothing more, Gene? No, uh, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's a challenging one because, uh, yeah, that. I mean, we do have to be concerned about bank runs and panics. Uh, so, yeah, there is, there is arguably scope or justification to do something. Uh, as you agree, as you've mentioned, it's a yeah, it's a partial bailout, isn't it? Rather than a a full bailout, it's not bailing out the company; it's bailing out the depositors. I think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have gone as far as they as they did because I think a lot of those players should have been sophisticated enough uh, to yeah to have to have seen the the potential risks. And some of these startups had very large deposits, I mean, millions of dollars. I think Canva even had money in there, if I remember Ooh. correctly. I believe so. so. Um, yeah. And interestingly, it turns out that uh, it ended up being. Silicon Valley Bank was quite a woke bank and they had a lot of investments in uh, climate change startups, solar power, alternative energy. Uh, and if, if, if you were a skeptical person, a cynical person, you couldn't help but wonder whether the Biden administration had an extra bias towards bailing out those uh, businesses, those climate change businesses that they had helped subsidize and they also helped bail them out now that they had an account with that bank. So, but anyway, we, we, we don't really know. Look, I suspect they would have bailed it out anyway, because I think most politicians are scared of taking the immediate uh, economic hit. If you can take a, a short, sharp economic hit and create huge costs in the future, most politicians take that. Uh, well, if you can avoid a short, sharp recession, but create huge costs in the future, most politicians take that deal uh, because they don't want to feel the short, sharp pain right now because politicians tend to be thinking along the, uh, the timeline of election cycles rather than the, uh, the complete sort of economic business cycles. Uh, and that, so I, I suspect they would have done some sort of bailout anyway, unfortunately, because of that. But yes, I, I can't help but shed a tear for the poor work bank uh, going bust. Um, Melissa says here, the saying is, don't put your all your eggs in one basket for a reason. Yeah, look, I, I agree to some degree, although I note you can't really expect many businesses to be banking with too many different banks that would create additional transaction costs, which would create another internal inefficiency in those businesses. What I would like the businesses instead to do is if they're not in a position to, to handle the risks that are associated with higher returns, I would like them to go out of their way to assess the, the risk structure of the bank they're dealing with and if they need to avoid that risk, pick a very safe bank. I mean, there are plenty of different banks out there. This is one of the issues with the moral hazard. There are some banks out there, even before the GFC, that were very well capitalized 
and had high levels of reserves. I mean, these are the two main things to see uh, the sort of the, the safety of your bank. How many reserves do they have? I.e., when you deposit $100 with them, how much do they keep in reserve? Say if it's a 5% reserve, then they keep $5, and then the other 95% they lend out. So that's one thing to check. And some banks had very high reserves and were very safe. Uh, they gave lower returns because of it, but they, they gave you more safety. The other issue to look at is the capital asset ratio. So that the assets they they the total assets they control, how much of that is capital and how much of that is from deposits. And if more of it's from capital, then the less likely they are to go insolvent. So the capital asset ratio is your buffer against insolvency, your deposit ratio, your buffer against illiquidity, a big buffer on both counts, and you've got a very safe bank. And the current situation we have is we're not bailing out the safe banks. They're safe. They don't have a problem. They did the right thing and they're not being rewarded. And instead, what we're going to do is potentially, if the government does, can't find the money to uh, make all the depositors whole, they're going to put a tax on banks. That is to say that banks that did the right thing and were responsible are going to have to pay extra tax to the government to bail out depositors who invested in banks that weren't responsible. So yet again, we're punishing prudent behavior and rewarding imprudent behavior. And if you keep doing that, you're just going to end up with people choosing quite rationally in their own life more imprudent behavior which is the, the problem there. So I think there was, there was such a thing, especially in America, and there can be again, as prudent, safe banks. They can just be very risk averse, have a high reserve ratio, a high capital asset ratio, be very safe, and you can be very secure putting your money there. And you can have other banks that have a, a lower reserve ratio and a lower capital asset ratio, and they will be higher risk and higher return. And customers should be very self-aware in which one they pick. And if they pick the high risk one, they should accept the consequences. If it works, they get more money. If it doesn't, they lose their money. And if they can't afford to lose the money, they should pick the low risk bank. So that's what I mean. I, I don't know if all businesses should necessarily be banking with four different banks just to diversify the risk, but I, I wish they would pick a bank with the risk profile that matched their situation. That is what I would uh, recommend for them. Yeah. John, what I would say is that, um, it's not a choice between, you know, just putting it in one bank or putting it in multiple banks. It's it's also a choice between putting it in a bank and then investing some of that money in in other types of assets. I mean, you had all of these. It looks like you had all of these startups that had their their money. Their, their you know they wanted it in a current account. They wanted it readily accessible, highly liquid. And I don't know. I mean, that might be because of you know they've got a high burn rate, so to speak. Uh, they, you know, they they need it for their payroll and uh, just their cost of operations. But it looks like they had lots of cash in this bank. Whereas, why aren't they in inv investing in in other assets? Uh, you know, why aren't they putting in a, you know, a managed fund or something? Or uh, why aren't they putting in an ETF? I mean, it, it just seems strange to me. Like that's what really surprise me about uh about this story um so yeah i i find it um odd that they had so much uh sitting in those uh bank accounts um but look it, it could yeah. reflect that yeah a lot of these startups they get lots of money lots of venture capital money to get set up and they don't really manage that well uh they just leave it there they're not they're not thinking about the opportunity cost of uh, having those funds in a a current uh, a current account uh, yeah it just seems all very strange to me and there was also the odd behavior of the bank too that it wasn't uh, hedging its interest rate risk I don't know if you came across that point that was a point that Chris yeah. Joy made in the AFR that it didn't cover itself for that that problem yeah. that you talked about earlier that's a, that, that's a really, the second one especially is a really good point I alluded to it before when I said that the bank the Silicon Valley Bank, had uh, a bad risk management over their assets. And that's what I meant, yes. right? That they hadn't, uh, they hadn't hedged against quite a foreseeable risk. I did notice the, the American division of that bank didn't have a, a risk manager for about six months last year, which is, uh, I think, a, a bad internal decision. They still had a diversity, inclusion, and equity officer, but they didn't have a risk manager. Uh, so that, that, I think, was a mistake. And look, uh, the decision of the companies that were banking with uh, Silicon Valley Bank you may be right that it was imprudent. I don't know enough about the details internally of those businesses. Some of them may have needed, you know, as you say, a high burn rate. 
Uh, some of them just may have just recently got the line of credit. I, I don't know what would make sense for them to invest in. So I'm, I, I'm hesitant to second guess their uh, investment portfolio. My main criticism of them is that they should have picked a bank that, uh, that, that aligned with their capacity to accept, to, to tolerate risk. But the main criticism really of, of bad asset management, bad uh, management of the risk over their assets was uh, the bank itself. And but that's the thing that the customers then should have been looking at. Like what is the, the risk profile of the bank's assets? And the idea of investing that heavily into government bonds and then not hedging against the possible risk of interest rate increases. I mean, I've got to say, d did they really think there was zero chance of interest rate increasing. So they thought even though there was an unprecedented amount of money slushing around the economy, an unprecedented increase in the broad amount of money in the economy chasing goods, they thought the risk of inflation and that leading to interest rate increases was so low they wouldn't even bother hedging it. That, that I think was a, a remarkable decision. It's not like interest rate increases were unpredictable. That is a fairly normal risk to have uh, at least on the table as a possible you know, outcome. And if you know that you, all of your depositors are from the same industry, if that industry all needs to get their money out at the same time, there could be a liquidity issue, then you would have thought that they did some thinking about that risk profile of their assets. So um, yeah, poor, poor asset management from the bank. But uh, I think the, as I've said this already, but to repeat it, I think the interesting question here is, look, the bank made mistakes. Lots of businesses make mistakes, right? The, the broader question is how you set a set of incentives so that long-term businesses tend towards fewer mistakes, not zero, right? There's no such thing as zero mistakes. All humans are fallible. Uh, there's always going to be mistakes. And in the market system, when it works properly, what you do is you set up a set of incentives to uh, minimize the number of mistakes by setting up those incentives that really reward good behavior and really unreward, punish uh, unproductive behavior, you set up the incentives to weed out the bad behavior. Uh, you set up the incentives to make prudent risk decisions. Uh, and that's supposed to be the, the virtue of the market is exactly that you align these incentives. And that is in contradistinction to the political incentives. The political incentives are you're playing with someone else's money. Right? I mean, so the moral hazard is exacerbated in the political system because if you make a mistake, oh, it's just taxpayers' money. Right? And if you invest the taxpayer's money well, you don't really get a bonus, right? You're still just a bureaucrat getting paid what you get paid. So there's, the incentives for politicians are particularly bad. And we are tiptoeing towards a system where we're going to have political allocation of capital. And if you want to see where that ends up, have a, have a look at the risk profile of Chinese banks. Uh, some of those Chinese banks are, are nominally private, but everyone knows that there is massive political interference in the allocation of capital in Chinese banks. And the amount of bad debts floating around the Chinese banking system is astonishing. If China has their financial crisis, if, well, they eventually will. But when they do, it's probably going to be linked to this, right? The political allocation of capital. It's, it's so not a part of the Yeah, sorry, John. A uh, question here from Sandy. Uh, there's a lot of chatter about central banks now pausing rate hikes. Look, I think that chatter makes sense. Um, do, do I agree that they might do it? Yes. Uh, do I think that they should? Look, the issue is I, I think at this point central banks should be considering a pause anyway. Now, I'm not saying no more tightening, but I'm saying it's getting to the point where instead of the decision being should it be 25 basis points or 50 basis points or 75 basis points, uh, the decision is getting towards should it be zero or 25. So I could understand if they wanted to uh, hold off a month. Um, the Westpac chief economist thinks that they will go ahead and that they should go ahead with another rate increase in Australia. I think it's looking likely that the Fed might hold off. One of the implications of how the US government is intervening is actually to increase money supply. Right? So one of the responses here has been to increase the amount of loans given from the Fed uh, into the banking sector in America, which is going to increase money supply. It would be odd if they did that simultaneously while increasing interest rates. Um, but before we know the full fallout, of these banking collapses, uh, then it wouldn't be crazy for the bank, the, the RBA and the Fed to be a little cautious and just keep a close eye on it for the next couple of weeks. This is one of the reasons, by the way, I think they should have increased rates much more quickly last year to get up to a higher interest rate. So they could have paused the increases by you know months ago. But uh, yeah, what do you think, Gene? Are they going to pause the uh, rate hikes? Oh, I'd say probably not. I mean, but I'm guessing that this story 
is over in a week. I could be wrong. Um, if it's over in a week, then I think we'll start worrying about the overheating economy and inflation, or they will in the States. I mean, we just had a strong US jobs number, didn't we, last, uh, last week? Uh, 300,000 new jobs in, uh, was it February or January? Whichever month the, the latest print was for. Um, so look, I think there's still a lot of strength in the US economy. My feeling is that we'll move on from this. I'm not concerned about a new financial crisis. Of course, I'm, you know, it's still too early to really make a call on this, but I'd be guessing that they will keep continuing. Yeah, it's, it's probably likely at some point. Um, a, a comment coming in here from Dot Connector. Glass-Steagall Act separated commercial banks from investment banks and was repealed. Uh, while true, I don't know if it's overly relevant to this situation, given that the Silicon Valley Bank, I don't think was uh, banking for most retail sort of commercial customers. Uh, so it was uh, potentially operating much like an investment bank anyway. Um, but yes, uh, there, there's been regulations going up and down. The idea, by the way, that the financial system has been deregulated is a bit of a furphy. The regulations get changed. The amount of regulation on the financial sector is massive. It does change up and down, flows left and right and sideways. Uh, so I, I grant your point that sometimes those shifts could be in the wrong direction. Uh, but the idea that we have a deregulated financial sector is ridiculous. The, no, no one would be able to, if you spent the rest of your life reading the regulations, you wouldn't be able to get through them. That's not what deregulation looks like. Um, but yeah, we, we've got an issue here where I think at some stage we need to start taking a shift towards a much more free market approach to capital allocation, or we have to just accept that we're, we're steadily going towards the path of political allocation. Because it's very hard to maintain this position of being half pregnant, of trying to pretend we're capitalists when the system goes well, and then embracing uh, Bernie Sanders' socialism when the system goes badly. So I, I have some sympathy with the, the socialists saying, right, just nationalize it at this point. I don't think we should but I, I have some sympathy with their frustration at the status quo, which is half pregnant, heavily regulated, but um, occasionally still pr pretending there's pseudo capitalism on the side. So pick a lane, pick a lane, financial sector. Um, look, I, I think we're gonna wrap this one up a bit early, Gene, um, which, you know, inside the hour, that's healthy for us. Get home a little bit earlier. Uh, any last thoughts? Oh, I thought there was some. There was an interesting comment at the end here on uh, or a question about nuclear submarines. Any comments on billions of dollars going to nuclear submarines despite the ban on nuclear in Australia? Well, uh, look, I mean, yeah, it's a, a hefty price tag, but uh, look, uh, national security is an important issue, and I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with nuclear submarines. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with nuclear power in Australia, but you know we're never going to have it, or it's unlikely we'd have it given the political uh, uh, concerns. Uh, yeah, just the political opposition to it. But yeah, I don't have a a problem with the nuclear submarines, uh, other than the fact that they look uh, horrendously expensive. All right, I disagree with your your second point on nuclear power. I, I think we're getting close to the cusp where the political winds are going to change really dramatically. I think these issues uh, build up slowly, 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 and everyone says no, and then something triggers and something flips. And then everyone said, oh, I was always for it. I was for it all along. And then everyone will get on board. Uh, you may remember I used this as the example, the same sex marriage discussion. There was support for same sex marriage slowly building, but in the political front, everyone was against it. You know, Barack Obama was against it. Kevin Rudd was against it. Everyone was against it. And then something just flipped. And suddenly everyone was for it and everyone pretended they were always for it and it became inevitable. There's been a few other political issues like this. They, they, they look impossible right up to the point where they start to look inevitable. I think nuclear power is going to be one of those issues. And I think we're getting steadily closer to the point where it's going to flip from looking impossible to looking inevitable. And a lot of people are going to come out of the woodwork and pretend that I was for it all along. I was just staying quiet, you know, secretly supporting. But I think the, the argument for legalizing nuclear power is, is overwhelming. If you're a free marketeer, you shouldn't be banning an energy source. If you are worried that uh, CO2 is going to le lead to an unstoppable runaway climate catastrophe, it is absurd to block a technology that uh, 
uh, is an alternative to fossil fuels. So I, I think its time is going to come. Uh, whether it actually makes economic sense, that's an open question, because realistically, I think uh, coal and gas might still be the cheaper option for Australia, but that is a topic for another day. Um, uh, as for whether we should be paying for the nuclear submarines, I, I gotta be honest, I haven't looked into it enough to know whether it would make sense. And I also just don't know enough about how it would fit in with our other military capabilities. Um, I worry about the amount of waste that exists in the Department of Defense. It, it really is, we talked before about moral hazard. The incentives are so important. Of course, an economist would say that, but just because I, just because you could predict I'd say it, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Incentives are hugely important and there is no real, there's no proper incentives or feedback system inside the Department of Defense to ensure efficient spending of money. And I worry about that. Uh, having said that, uh, as Gene, as you said before, national defense is something that does make sense for the government to do. How you square that circle, I don't know. Uh, there needs to be more thought going into how you improve the efficiency of our defense dollars being spent. Uh, hopefully get then a better quality defense at a lower cost. Uh, but at the moment, uh, I understand people's uh, tolerance for overspending in the Defence Department. Uh, I get that people want a strong Defence Force. I just ask those people to remember the incentives aren't great inside the DoD uh, and they do waste a lot of money. And if uh, the people want us to spend more on Defence, I would urge you to please consider ways that we could improve the efficiency inside the Department of Defence so that it's a bit easier to get on board with that increase in spending. Um, as Tim says, it's no stress to spend other people's money. That's true. In a lot of other departments, there is uh, some better forms of feedback. Uh, you have like output reporting and outcome reporting in a lot of departments. And if some of the outputs uh, are, are working better, then they can get more of the funding or they can use that as, as it's like an internal price mechanism inside some government departments, which can help to improve the allocation of, of resources. Inside defense, they just have one outcome, Defend Australia. Right. I mean, that, that is way too esoteric to be able to, to help give signals for efficient allocation of resources. And any time the Department of Defense is asked, can you find some budget savings? They come back and say, yeah, yeah, we could just get rid of the Navy or, or some other sort of ridiculous answer. <laughs> and of course, the politician would turn around and say, oh, no, I could never do that. Right. I, I would look too weak on defense. Uh, and then, you know, then we're caught where we are. So I don't know the solution. But I'm just uh, reminding people that the incentives inside the Department of Defense are not pretty. Um, that was a nice segue. As we said uh, at the start of this, we are happy to go down uh, rabbit holes or, or answer any other questions that come up as we go. Uh, having said that, I will try to close this out before the end of the hour. So, uh, Jean, thank you very much for, for coming in again. Look forward to next week. Next week, it's your turn to uh, pick the topic and have a rant. Hopefully, your microphone's working. Yeah, uh, thanks, that, John. We do this every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Queensland time, 8 p.m., uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania time. I was at uh, 7.30 South Australia and 5 p.m. WA. So please uh, tune in Tuesday, uh, YouTube and Facebook. You can follow us at um, uh, John Humphreys, my personal account, uh, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and The Good Source. And if you haven't already, please go to all of those accounts on YouTube. Give us a, a like, give us a follow. And I look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Hey, DJ, what do you think of the budget? Budget naughty. Yeah, budget naughty.